So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, <clears throat> and when you think about the LNF, maybe a lot of people think about microelectronics. Um, but there's lots of applications in biomedical areas, and so that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, particularly focusing on how micro nanofluidics, manipulation and culture of cells, can have interaction and exchange with concepts and electrical engineering, concepts and methods in electrical engineering and micro nanofabrication. Okay, so what, are, what is the motivation for the types of things that we do? There are many situations in medicine and biology where you need to culture or manipulate living cells outside of the body. This may be to test drugs to see if it works on cells before you test it on people, or to uh, better perform cell-based therapies where living cells need to be manipulated outside the body uh, before treatment. Now the challenge is, the same cells, well first of all, it's quite amazing that living cells can be grown outside of the body, often in dishes like this. The problem is, the cells grow, yes, but often the same cells can behave very differently when they're in the body versus when they're in the dish. So what that leads to is skewed results in cell-based drug testing or cell-based therapies that may underperform. So the question is, can microfluidics help close this gap between the body and the dish? So just one example of the magnitude of this problem, and this is an example of drug development. So this slide shows that every year for the last several decades, the cost of drug development has increased. So in, in the electronics industry, you have Moore's Law, where the uh, efficiency of uh, memory chips and costs and things increase exponentially over time. In the drug industry, we have the opposite phenomena. They call it Arum's Law, which is Moore's Law spelled backward, where the efficiency is decreasing uh, year over year. And at least a part of the uh, challenge is due to uh, suboptimal cell-based tests. So what can we do? In our lab, our approach is to make, you might say, microscale integrated humans. That's our ultimate vision. We want cell culture systems that are miniaturized plus mimic a little bit better some aspect of what the cells might experience in the body more than what it might experience in a dish. So this slide shows some of the examples of things we do. Today I'll specifically talk about a lung on a chip and some in vitro fertilization chips and then some uh, blood vessel manipulation. So we want to make a mini human. What might be some important things to do so that the cells cultured in this device feel like they might be in the body of a living person. So let me ask the question a little differently. What would you do to check if a person is alive or not? Temperature, okay, that's a good one. Heartbeat, breathing. So yes, exactly. So those are the types, uh, there's many things that you can think of to uh, try to make a better physiological cell culture, but some of the microfluidic things that really jumped out at us are the pulsatile uh, oscillatory nature of fluid flow in living systems. So heartbeat, uh, breathing, even in uh, parts inside the body, like the oviduct, there are contractions and flows that generate uh, pulsatility. And so, uh, can this type of flow culture environment help recreate better physiology? So my first example is in the lung, breathing. So you all look healthy, so your lung stethoscope sounds should sound like this. So it's, so it's mainly breathing sounds. 
If you get sick, the doctor wants to listen to your lung with a stethoscope for, and see if there are other sounds like So these are called crackle sounds. So, so this is a very interesting fluid mechanical phenomena that happens because you're breathing, but there are additional things that go on. So when you get sick, what can happen in, in your lung is that your na natural surfactant decreases or does not function appropriately. Then what happens is that the liquid lining in your airways will form a little plug and because you breathe the plug moves back and forth and when they pop they make a sound. So this is like slurping on the bottom of your soda cup with a straw and your mother didn't like it. Uh, this can happen in your lung when you get sick. So the doctors will listen to this because they know it's an important symptom. Our question was, could the fluid mechanical stresses associated with this event be a contributor to the disease as well? So what's happening at the cellular level? So this is a, this is a question that cannot be asked, asked in conventional dish culture of cells because there's no liquid plugs that can be formed in dish culture of cells. <coughs> It's actually also hard to study it in real lungs because the liquid plug formation process in the real lung is stochastic. And it's also difficult to image. So what can we do? How about using principles of microelectronics microfabrication and apply it to making microchannels that can grow lung cells? So this is a device that uh, a graduate student made several years ago. It has two channels, one on the top and one on the bottom, separated by a porous membrane. The cross section looks like this. This is important because we culture cells at the interface on the porous membrane, which allows us to supply cells with nutrients from the bottom while exposing the top side to air. This makes the lung cells feel like they're in the body in an air-liquid environment. And this makes them differentiate and behave differently. So now, the next thing we want to do is to have a way to create liquid plugs in a controlled manner. So in the body, this happens arbitra in arbitrary position at arbitrary times in the lung. How can we, we control this better? So we made a microfluidic liquid plug generator that's shown like this. So this uh, liquid plug generator takes advantage of laminar flows. That is, <clears throat> we have an air-liquid orderly laminar two-phase flow system that is normally flowing air to the lung cell culture uh, chamber, which is not shown, which is over here. When we stop the airflow, the entire region here fills with liquid. Now when we restart the airflow, a little liquid plug gets cut off here and sent to the lung chamber. So in this way, we can control liquid plug formation in ways not possible in real lung systems. And, and for this system, uh, the valving system is a uh, solenoid valve like this, where we have the tube with air flowing, and then there's a little uh, mechanical uh, switch that will pinch the uh, tube. So, what does it look like? So you're going to see a little liquid plug, and you'll, you'll hear a little sound. So that is a liquid plug in a microfluidic lung, and, uh, and the acoustics associated with this event, which actually mimics stethoscope sounds in your lung reasonably well. So now we have a system with liquid plug generation and lung cells that are cultured at an air-liquid interface. So what happens? <clears throat> so in the situation of a healthy lung, where you don't have crackles, your cells, lung cells, are green and healthy. 
but as we increase the number of liquid plug propagation events, we start to see more and more red injured cells, and the more we have it, the more we uh, get damaged. Also, if you look carefully, this is the downstream region over here. There's a little bit more red injury in the downstream region compared to the upstream region, and that's closer to the region where you have the liquid plug rupture. Uh, this is the graduate student that uh, did this work, now a professor at uh, UPenn. This is a simulation done by our collaborator, Professor Grotberg, showing why the downstream region may have more injury than the upstream region. Okay, so let's see. So there's a little movie here. So we see that the liquid plug, as it moves downstream, gets narrower and narrower, narrower because it loses liquid. The velocity gets higher and the pressures and stresses at the wall increase as well. Uh, and so this explains why the downstream region might have more damage. And it answers the question, how bad can these very small liquid plugs in your lungs be? And the answer is, if you have surfactant dysfunction, as can happen when you're sick, it can have a major contribution to small airway injuries. One of the most uh, uh, significant situations where this type of surfactant dysfunction or, or lack of surfactants can happen is actually in premature babies. Uh, the lung is not well developed and the uh, uh, babies can die because of this type of injury. And so uh, we use this device to test a therapeutic that is clinically used to see if we could rescue our microfluidic lungs uh, from lung injury. So this is the type of uh, result you get when the lung is healthy. So this y-axis is cell viability. And in the healthy situation, we have high viability. But when we have surfactant dysfunction and liquid plugs, we get these injured cells. Now in the same situation, if we had the pulmonary surfactants given to uh, premature babies, we can see that we can prevent this injury, uh, keeping the lung in this type of healthy state. So this is an example where we can use this type of unique microfluidic cell culture system to test and evaluate therapeutics in ways that you just can't do in a conventional dish culture of cells. Okay, and these are uh, more postdocs and students. Uh, professor at University of Akron, he's actually an MD resident here at uh, U of M now that uh, did this work. Okay, so my first example was about recreating a disease on a chip. So how about uh, enhancing cell-based therapy? And this is a topic about infertility. So infertility is a problem that affects millions of couples in the U.S. alone. There are various causes and the need for therapy is increasing. There are treatments, but it's expensive and there is room for improvement. The causes are about 40% male factor 40% female factor and 20% both are unknown. In the case of in vitro fertilization, where the sperm and egg and embryo are uh, brought together outside the body, there are additional causes of damage or suboptimal cell handling. That includes the dish culture of embryos and centrifugation of the sperm. So, can microfluidics enhance this type of cell-based therapy? So this is an example of the embryo culture gap. So the fertilized egg in the body will spend the first five days being gently nurtured by the fallopian tube, and then it will implant. In in vitro fertilization, the insemination, fertilization of the egg, as well as the first five days are spent in a dish. So if you were an embryo, 
how would you feel being cultured in a dish rather than a fallopian tube? So we can actually quantify this, for example, by counting the number of cells at day five of culture from mouse model embryos in the mother's bot from the mother's uh, fallopian tube versus in the dish. And this is what we see. On average, there are about 145 cells per embryo from the in vivo embryos, whereas in the best dish cultures available out there with all the different biochemical additives, it's on average about 65 cells. And this is important because lower pregnancy rates compared to these embryos. So can we do something with microfluidics? So the one thing that uh, uh, is important out of many is that the fluid environment in the oviduct is pulsatile. There are muscle contractions of the tube as well as a beating of cilia that generates a gentle pulsatile flow. So the question is, well, technologically, first, the question is, okay, how can we create a pulsing oviduct-like environment efficiently uh, that a clinician can use? So in our first lung on a chip, we used a solenoid valve. So one thing we could do, and many microfluidic devices will do this, is to string multiple solenoid valves together to control multiple uh, pneumatic valves to do pumping and valving. So this is one way that uh, we can try to do this. But this is a little bit complicated for clinical use. So we wanted to make something a little bit more cleaner, and so this is the type of system that uh, we came up with that I'll uh, describe a little bit more. So it's a computer-controlled system that sends uh, uh, electrical signal to piezoelectric actuators that then control flow in a microfluidic chip. So this is the system created by uh, some graduate students, an undergraduate student and a postdoc. It's a silicone rubber device that is flexible, optically transparent. It has thin channels towards the bottom. The embryo would be about that big, so the channel is actually much thinner, and uh, the purpose is not to put the embryos in the channels in this case, but just to create flow. So the system is placed on this piezoelectric actuator array, which is actually something called a braille display. Its real use is to allow blind people to read emails. But what we do is use computer-controlled piezoelectric actuator movement to do uh, fluidic control. So each pin pushing on this elastomeric channel functions as a valve. And then when we have three or more pins that are used in sequence, it forms a peristaltic pump. And so with this, the important thing is there are no tubes or interconnects. Yes, we still do have a piezoelectric actuator, but the uh, control is a little bit more practical for use in the clinic. In the embryos, they're exposed to computer-controlled fluid flow. So biologically, the question is, do the embryos notice? So this is the gap between the dish culture and the in-the-body culture. This is the cell number, and you see this large difference in cell numbers. So in the microfluidic system, how do the embryos do? It's the same cell culture media as here, but with the pulsatile environment, we get significantly enhanced embryo development. We, we've also tested pregnancy rates in mice. So these are microfluidic mice, and we observed 22% enhancement in, their, uh, in, the, in the pregnancy rates. Recently, uh, our collaborators have also taken this to the clinic, uh, and we've analyzed the human embryo development rate differences. Not quite pregnancy rates yet, 
but it's known to have a high correlation with pregnancy outcomes. So here we have data for day three embryos. And we could see that the cell number per embryo is already better in the blue microfluidics compared to conventional cultures. The grade of embryos at day three is also better. Here the lower number is better. At day five, the, the advantages become even greater for the microfluidic device. So we're very excited that uh, uh, some of our devices, uh, they may have cell therapeutic applications as well. So why might the embryos notice pulsatile flow? So this is a little bit of effort to try to understand this. So here's an embryo, here's an embryo. Conventional static microdrop culture or dynamic microfluidic culture. And some of the uh, differences include the chemical environment. There can be uh, uh, nutrient and waste refreshing. And there are also some chemical agitation, uh, mechanical stimulation that the embryos might feel. And so uh, this concept of chemical mechanical stimulation difference, this is something that uh, uh, should be an important uh, feature of pulsed microfluidic cultures for many systems, uh, not just embryos. <clears throat> so hopefully you're getting a sense that, oh, pulsing seems useful for cell culture. So we wanted to dig deeper. Okay, so pulsing, that means there's different frequencies. And electrical engineers talk about frequency modulated signaling or things like that a lot. So in biology, is there a optimal frequency? What is the frequency dependence of my biological system? So we wanted to ask this quantitatively in biochemical circuits. So this is the particular circuit that we chose to do this. So this signaling pathway is part of the autonomous nervous system. It controls insulin release in your pancreas. I guess we're still sufficiently early that we're not getting hungry yet. But when you get hungry and think of food, your mouth salivates. That's thanks to this signaling pathway. So some of these signals can be biochemically pulsing. Uh, and so we wanted to ask the question, how does different pulsing stimulation of the receptor translate into intracellular calcium oscillations? And how does that in turn activate transcription factors that might lead to salivating or, or, or other things. <clears throat> this is how we do it experimentally. We use that microfluidic system to generate biochemical pulses. We can do live cell imaging of calcium oscillations that result from different pulsing stimulation patterns. And then we can look at ultimate transcription factor activation by looking at the rate of or the uh, ratio of the green transcription factor in the cytosol versus inside the nucleus. So, so the green kind of went into the nucleus when it got activated. <clears throat> now to understand this quantitatively, we needed a mathematical model of the biochemical circuit. And it turns out when we started this study, uh, there were already multiple potential mathematical models that might fit the cell and signal, uh, the signaling pathway in the cell that we were studying. So we tested about eight of them, at least the ones that were uh, uh, accessible in terms of the <coughs> mathematics. And it turns out none of the existing uh, models could explain our uh, experimental ob observation. So we at first had to spend significant amount of time refining and expanding the signaling pathway model. And this is a collaboration with Professor Jennifer Linderman. 
And so we did that. So what did we find? We found that the different steps work as different filters. The cell surface receptors function as a low-pass filter, meaning they will let through lower frequency stimulation better. And then it turned out the calcium to transcription factor activation step, that functioned as a high-pass filter, letting higher frequency generate more transcription factor activation. The combined effect was a band-pass filtering of the signal. So this is another way to look at this. So when we have extracellular biochemical pulsing of the receptor, we might do a low frequency stimulation, in which case the low pass receptor is very happy and will happily pass the signaling along to the intracellular calcium uh, step. However, the next step, which is a high pass filter, does not respond to the low signal, and so we don't get efficient uh, transcription factor activation. So you might say, how about really fast stimulation? including continuous stimulation. And then what happens is that the receptor becomes desensitized and downregulated. Now this is the type of thing that happens when you walk into a fudge store in Mackinac Island. It smells really good in the beginning and then you kind of uh, don't smell it as much anymore. So, so this type of effect will uh, cause the signal to not pass efficiently to the calcium step. It's only when you have an intermediate frequency that the receptor is reasonably happy and the signal passes on uh, to the transcription factor activation step as well. So what does this mean practically for cell culture? It means conventionally in dish culture, we do continuous stimulation with a chemical or a growth factor. We just add it to the dish and the cell is always seeing this signal. What this is telling us is that it might be better if you do pulsed stimulation. Even though the cell is gonna see less overall chemical because you're resting in between, that might give more, more response from cells than just continuous stimulation in a dish. And so we looked at that or I should say Madresh looked at this, and he found that yes, indeed. So the, so the gray is the microfluidic pulsing stimulation, and the black is the continuous dish stimulation, and at all concentrations, when we use an optimal frequency, we could see better enhanced transcription factor activation. And for, from a device standpoint, uh, we're very excited because we can, we're using the same cells, same receptor ligand, actually at less amounts, and we can get enhanced response from the cells. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, now you're even more convinced that pulsing is important. So the next question is how can we generate this uh, pulsing environment more efficiently? And how can we learn from microelectronics? So one day, so how many of you are students or postdocs here? Okay, okay. So have you ever gone to your advisor at, with a great idea and your, great, and your advisor says, ah, oh, that's not gonna work? Maybe not your advisors, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I did that here. So Bobak Mosadeg, who's now a professor at Cornell, came to me one day and said, hey, Shu, I think I can make a microfluidic equivalent of a two-transistor oscillator. And I said, ah, I don't know, that sounds too good to be possible. So he went off. Apparently he made like 50 trial and error device designs, but then came back with this. So it's a microfluidic uh, transistor-like oscillator that has transistor-like switches that talk to each other and it has a time delay capacitance uh, using uh, compliant materials. This is how this oscillator works. 
uh, initially one valve is open, the other is closed. Fluid flows through from the open one to the bottom of the other one, keeping it closed, and then flows out. As time goes on, however, there is a syringe pump that is continuously pushing fluid. So the pressure builds up here, and it'll eventually break through. Now this fluid goes to the bottom of this one, closing this one off, and just the red flows through, and this repeats. And here is the oscillator. Syringe pumps pushing. If we put pressure transducers, we could also see the pressure fluctuations alternating between the green and red fluid. And he went on and did additional things, made oscillator arrays, a timed switching system to perform immunoassays, and so forth. So why, why is this important or interesting? So I showed the Braille-based valving system, which was a little bit com more convenient than using an array of solenoid valves. However, to have more valves, more controls, we need more Braille pins, more actuators, more connections, and more controls. What the new fluidic transistor allows us to think about is embedding the thinking on the chip as well. So we need to flow cell culture media anyways. Why not use that cell culture uh, solution flow to power the logic and the thinking as well. So that's what uh, the promise of this uh, circuit provides. So this, this syringe pump driven tr fluidic transistor circuit was a good start, we felt. However, it still also had some limitations. First of all, we want to get rid of external actuators and we still had a syringe pump. More importantly, as a consequence of using the syringe pump, we have huge fluct uh, pressure fluctuations. This is kind of like electrical power surges that might, that might screw up your uh, electrical circuits. Here, it actually limits the fluidic circuitry that we can have in parallel. So if you look at this oscillator array, they all have the same frequency. This is by design or by limitation. We had to have the same frequency because of this pressure crosstalk. So can we design fluidic circuits that don't require a syringe pump and don't have these pressure fluctuations? And recently, uh, we've been able to come up with a new uh, circuit architecture that can, that can accomplish this. So this is the new design, which I won't go into detail, but the important thing is, now the system works just on a constant pressure gravity head. So we don't need external uh, actuators. And because there is no fluctu uh, pressure fluctuation upstream at the fluid source, we can have in parallel multiple different frequency uh, operations going on. And uh, I'll play this again. So if you look carefully, there are three different oscillators oscillating at different frequencies, all driven by the same gravity head uh, flow source. And this is a chip that we call the heartbeat chip. It's recreating different types of heartbeats, uh, slow heartbeat, physiological heartbeat, exercising like crazy heartbeat, uh, and we have uh, different flow rates meaning it's more like the artery or veins and so forth. Uh, Sun Jing, the postdoc, also added blood vessel cells to these devices and looked at their shape change. So blood vessel cells are known to change shape when you have uh, blood flow. And so this is what we saw. So with faster flow, we get more response in cell shape change which was expected. What was less studied and not uh, known very well previously was that there was a frequency dependence regardless of the uh, uh, shear stress level. And interestingly, we could see that, again, an intermediate frequency, sort of like bandpass, 
seem to give the maximal response. Technologically, uh, this was very important for us because now we have a scalable system, a scalable circuit architecture that runs on a constant low pressure uh, driving force. And so we believe that now we can start to have better analogy with electronic circuits so that, uh, you know, the electronic circuits spent many generations and now there's like 2 billion transistors, 22 nanometer, uh, circuits. We don't aspire that much integration, but uh, we have started to uh, combine at least hundreds of elements together in a medium scale integration, and it's the type of thing that uh, we hope can contribute to this type of uh, uh, microfluidic human on a chip, organ on a chip systems where the thinking and fluidic control is integrated in the fluidics as well. Okay, my last topic is about uh, nanofluidics and reading off the epigenetic memory inside your cells. <clears throat> so, so shown here are three different types of cells. Brain cells, heart cells, stem cells. Just looking at them, it, they look very different. but they all have the same DNA inside them. Why are they so different? Furthermore, uh, the stem cells, for example, they know their stem cells, and when they divide, they're still stem cells. Or your intestine cells, they know their intestine cells, when they divide, their daughter cells know, remember, that they're intestine cells. So how does that happen? <clears throat> so we know that DNA is kind of like the uh, tape memory of the cell. The difference between different cell types is how that nanotape memory is packaged. So for example, uh, the DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones to form nucleosomes. These nucleosomes can additionally be tightly packaged or loosely packaged, making the accessibility of the data different. So this one is more accessible, that one is less accessible. So there's lots of work on DNA sequencing to read the underlying potential of a cell, but what exactly a cell does will depend on this additional layer of packaging of the DNA. So how can we evaluate this better? There are special marks on the histone proteins, actually, not the DNA, that will uh, control what kind of accessibility there is. So for example, there are things like histone methylation, acetylation, and so forth. Interestingly, not only the DNA sequence but these packaging marks and packaging features are also inherited from mother to daughter cells. So some of the questions we're interested in is, first of all, can we read this off in single uh, chromatin fibers? Chromatin is what these fibers are called. And then can we use that to understand how these marks are inherited from mother to daughter? And this is challenging. This slide shows that it's actually a harder problem than sequencing. So how can we do this? Our approach is to use nanofluidics. We will labor, label the chromatin fibers with fluorescent labels. If Usually in solution, it's all coiled up. We want to first linearize and then read off what the marks are. So how can we do this? Well, it's been known that you can use nanochannels to, to introduce these chromatin fibers into, and then they will stretch out a little bit more. Now the challenge is, you need really narrow channels to really stretch the fibers out. However, that makes it 
more difficult to introduce the fibers. If you have large channels, the fiber can go in, but they're not stretched out. So we wanted to develop a method that could take advantage of both. So how can we do that? What about if we had a system that could be wide for loading and then narrowed for linearizing? And so Professor Yoon said, we want to hear your failures or mistakes. So here it is. <clears throat> so when we make microchannels, we often oxidize the silicone rubber pieces to activate the surface and then bond them together. So that's success. Sometimes you can overdo this step or mishandle your device and you can get failure or cracking. So usually this is unwanted. So one day we thought, wait a minute, maybe this can be used. What if we stretch really carefully with some added features? And it turns out you can do quite interesting uh, and uh, well-defined patterns of cracking. And these cracks can be controlled on the micro to nano scale. A procedure that we use a lot now was uh, actually uh, discovered by Krista Mills, a graduate student now. She's at uh, Professor RPI uh, in Michael Thales's lab. And this is how it works. We have two pieces of the silicone rubber one that's just flat and thin, and then the other that has microchannel features. Then we bring these two together, like this. Now if you stretch, you get cracks, but cracks that are sandwiched by flexible layers that don't crack. So those become nanochannels. <clears throat> so this is a close-up of this type of region of a microchannel in real time as nanochannels are fabricated by stretching and cracking. So these lines are the nanochannels that connect the two microchannels running in parallel. Now these channels, if you look carefully, are not exactly parallel. There's even some branching and things that can occur. So it's a little bit imperfect. But a graduate student, Byung Chul, found that if you introduce stress shielding uh, uh, structures that will sh shield flaws from stress, we could get very exact positions of the cracks. So these are uh, exactly where the, we want them uh, by controlling the stress. The most interesting feature about these channels is that they are normally closed. So after cracking, if we release the strain, <clears throat> the, the channels heal, and we get no channels. We can confirm that it's completely healed by measuring the electrical resistance. It's giga ohms, same as bulk PDMS. It's only when we stretch that the channels open up and the resistance goes down. And we can do this reversibly with a very simple device. And so now we could introduce the uh, DNA in the widened state, narrow to linearize more, and we can do this reversibly. In our initial devices, we introduce the DNA by an applied electric field. These days, we don't even use electric fields. We just widen the channel to suck the uh, DNA solution in, and then with successive narrowings, we combine nano confinement with hydrodynamic flows that can completely stretch DNA and then immobilize them. And this immobilizing uh, is actually very important because now we can combine uh, super resolution imaging to map uh, really fine details of the, of the markings. Uh, and these are just some of the examples, uh, some of the experiments we've done. We've shown that depending on the presence or absence of different packaging proteins, the tightness or looseness can be regulated. And how do we read this off? We can see that the 
average lengths are different between with and without this protein. Uh, this experiment also shows, shows that we can do vigorous yet gentle uh, stretching so that we can distinguish these structures. We could also do more detailed mapping where we've uh, labeled with different colors on the same chromatin fiber different types of marks so that we can stretch and then map and read what kind of packaging is being done with the uh, genetic memory material. And this was the uh, postdoc that uh, did this work and the graduate student that's carrying on, I see back in, uh, over in the back there, Joyce. So. Okay, so this is my last slide. So if any of you thought this was interesting, maybe I would like to learn more or get involved, I'd like to introduce you to the Microfluidics and Biomedical Sciences Training Program, also the Microfluidic Student Organization, which is open to postdocs and undergrads as well. And, and we just recently got approval for a graduate certificate in, for Microfluidics and Biomedical Sciences as well. So please come, and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, LNF, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. We're trying to measure the forces and movement of just a few cells. We could not get nice structures using conventional.